Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Julian Talbot. I'm your host for this presentation. Thank you very much for coming along to the first of our monthly webinar series. We lightheartedly call it How to Bribe a Policeman with a Can of Beer and a Bag of Cashews. Subtitle really is Risk Management in Africa, and I think it applies broadly to risk management in a host of uh, developing nations. Hopefully you'll find it interesting and useful. In, in one of my roles, I'm a director with the Security Analysis and Risk Management Association. It's uh, a group which started originally in Washington, but has a, an international interest and in chapters in Australia and uh, growing around the world. It, SAMA is about looking at security analysis in the broader sense. It started from the homeland security area and a group of professionals got together and said we need an association which is helping us improve the quality of risk management and it's broadened out to helping I guess national security issues, societal risk management resilience and how we use our resources better for this sort of area. Uh, that's about enough for SAMA. You can find us at SAMA.org and I'd encourage each of you to have a think about it. If you're interested in risk analysis and improving societal decision making I'd encourage you to have a look and think about joining. In my other role, I'm also the CEO of JBS, Jakeman Business Solutions, in, based in Canberra, Australia. We have offices around Australia and essentially we have a range of services including risk management consulting, strategic security consulting, project management. We have uh, a large managed services uh, division that look after records management. Among other things, we've had about 50 staff working in various client organisations and in consultancies including projects like the NBN, Department of Defence. We uh, run what's probably the largest implementation of a records management system in the Southern Hemisphere. So uh, all in all we're a fairly diverse and interesting group. Right, just to talk very quickly about me, how I came to be CEO of JBS and of Director of SAMA. I've had a, a more roles and jobs in my time than I care to mention but most recently until returning to JBS I was working in Africa as a uh, logistics manager for a remote exploration camp and uh, the couple of years there taught me a lot of things and I thought they were worth sharing just for general management and risk management point of view. It, if nothing else I think you'll get a laugh but you'll hopefully find a few stories there. Um, prior to that I was the manager of security for the North West Shelf Project, the manager of property and security for the Australian Trade Commission, sort of working across 60 countries there. I've uh, worked in a number of jobs, worked now on four continents uh, in resources sector, government, private sector. But uh, that's a very quick pricey of me. Let me get straight into the presentation. Now, like any good risk manager, I'm going to start with the context and talk about where we were from big picture. Uh, Africa, it's tempting to think of Africa as a single concept really it's a maze of about 50 countries and hundreds of tribes and cultures and a real mix. We were down in the east on the right there in a place called Tanzania. Now Tanzania is part of the uh, East African Congress and it's probably the largest country there and one of the most stable as well. Uh, parts of it are spectacularly beautiful, parts of it are uh, fairly depleted thanks to um, subsistence farming really. The area we were was in the far west, it was about five days drive to, literally five days, four wheel drive to get through to a uh, the camp we are at, which is on the, about 20 kilometres from the coast of Lake Tanganyika. When you actually get in there to uh, Mubango camp, that's about what we have. You can see the built up area where the blue marker is, is the camp through the trees and there's really not much to see. Literally the nearest village is about 14 kilometres away and apart from our airstrip there's nothing you can really see from the air. That being said, a fascinating part of the world. Um, one of the things Africa did teach me was very simply always have a backup plan and I think that's just good advice for any risk treatment or any strategy you ever come up with. You've probably come across the expression TIA, this is Africa, um, in films like Blood Diamond. There's uh, a couple other expressions you get used to. NHA, no hurry in Africa, and, and there never is. And uh, my favourite, I think, is whenever something goes wrong, it's always AWA. Africa wins again. And, and Africa always wins, no matter what you do, it will always find a way of being Africa, and uh, things will not work out as you expect. Where we were, literally two days safari to pick up fuel supplies. Uh, we had about 50 people working at camp, mostly locals, about 45 of those. Uh, I say local, probably 30 from the immediate area and another 10 or 15 from other areas of Tanzania. Um, 
I'll chat a little bit about the idea of political correctness and, and culture through this presentation and, and Africa doesn't have the concept of political correctness that we have in the West. Um, they're very blunt and uh, very tribal and very much proud of their culture. If you're uh, a Muha, you're very different from a Bantu and you're different from a, a Hutu, a Tutsi. Uh, when you check into a hotel, one of the questions asked on the form is, what's your tribe? Um, this is the crew, basically uh, a bit of a ragtag collection of us and uh, that's me in the middle lean in the back row leaning against the four-wheel drive with a dark shirt on. Uh, great bunch of guys and girls really work well together in a team but you just have to understand everybody's got their own little way of viewing it. In that whole picture if you take away the Mazungus there's about uh, Mazungus, Mazungus by the way is European Swahili for a white person or a European. So in the rest of the crew there's about three guys here with high school educations and we would set out teaching them computers, driving skills, technicians, mechanical work. Um, this was our alfresco dining room with a view over the Rift Valley and just down there in the back of the picture about 100 kilometres from there is uh, the theoretical home of uh, Homo sapiens where mankind first evolved in the Rift Valley. One of the reasons we always had to have a backup plan was this was our main access route to get in and out for supplies for anything other than flying in and in the wet season this is pretty much what happens. Um, and no that wasn't our vehicle fortunately, there was uh, another a group of uh, primate researchers vehicle got stuck in there and they were lucky because quite often that river is well over the roof of the vehicle. In the end they got it out but um, one of the realities of this part of the world is you just can't operate quite a lot of the time and maybe that river will come up when it rains 48 hours later on a good day the roads are some of the hardest hardest conditions in the world, hardest four wheel driving we would constantly be having to repair, we had a fleet of six vehicles which was amazingly challenging to keep on the road, that was a, a full time job for really two mechanics and a, uh, and a labourer being said we had uh, an air trip, we had every two weeks we'd have fresh supplies come in and we'd have occasional change of shifts we'd always uh, practice our emergency response procedures at the time uh, there's a chap called Mongo Mongo who's one of the local guys and, uh, and he loved his role there as the fire safety officer. The vehicle in the background is the one that we rolled this season and I'll show you one that we rolled last season and that was again the reality of the roads and, and new drivers and a driver training program that, uh, well, our backup plan for the supplies and the creek and the, the flight sometimes didn't come in or it couldn't come for weather or availability of aircraft or it was simply to have our own veggie garden and uh, we had a chap there called Johaya who knew almost no English and very little about anything else but he was a brilliant gardener. Um, you'll see the sort of stockpile that we had here in a minute. We had to fly everything in essentially um, and if they didn't have it in the supermarket which is two hours flight away um, we just didn't get it. There was no sort of note and you say oh you're just not getting cooking oil this week or you're not getting toilet paper or you're not getting toothpaste or whatever it might be so we had a, our backup plan was a veggie garden and a full pantry. The locals had their own way of getting around. This this is the equivalent of a road train in Tanzania and, uh, and bear in mind the tracks you can see there is one that we made which is one of the best roads. Pretty quickly once the, you left these tracks you went onto bicycle paths and uh, it's amazing what a load these guys could carry. Their backup plan for when the creek came up in the wet season was this and uh, literally a bit of a group effort for the village where the guys got together and built a hollowed out a tree and the ferryman made 300 shillings which is about 20 cents US per person for taking people across and that was his entire subsistence. That was one of our other vehicles uh, the year before we rolled another one at speed and uh, we decided that from that very quickly put in our own driver training program which reduced the wear and tear a lot on vehicles it also showed us a couple of people who we thought could drive were actually steering wheel attendants and uh, we very quickly decided that it was best if they were not drivers after they'd done our driving test. The roads are so rutted out there that you can run the wheels like a slot car down the, the gallery there. I'll leave time at the end for questions by the way so if you'd like to type questions in we'll get to them. I talk about wear and tear, this is a, a chassis on a Land Cruiser, um, basically one the same as in the last picture and when we talk about cracked chassis, we're talking about seriously cracked chassis. Uh, 
this is the, the workshop. Well, I had a couple of containers which stored our uh, mechanical tools, but essentially you uh, you worked on things where they were with what you had, and the nearest the nearest mechanic who I'd say was genuinely a mechanic would was literally um, three days drive away. So uh, the term fundi in Swahili means expert or technician, but what it actually meant, if you see that hammer in the front of the picture, if a bloke in the village had a hammer like that, then he was the local fundi and he could fix bicycles and he could fix motorcycles and he'd have a go at anything so uh, in the end we had to bring our own mechanics in just to keep our vehicles on the road. Needless to say everything out there had a price so nothing got thrown away. This was our collection of spare parts for generators, bicycles, you name it. Everything had some sort of value to us. Um, quite amazingly it had far more value even to the locals. The things we'd throw away like a a plastic water bottle that might have had uh, just drinking water in it would be valuable to them to the point of scrounging through there. These two chaps worked four days in exchange for this drum. Which we had a stockpile of spare drums there and, and we actually uh, agonised over the decision ironically of whether we should let people take diesel and Jet A1 drums away for health reasons and in the end we decided that probably the lesser of two evils was to let them use them provided we gave them soap and lessons and how to clean it out and we made them clean it out before they took it away um, so in the end they could do things like boil water and keep water in the dry season and the rest but uh, it just shows something which was of almost no value to us out there was worth eight days labour for two chaps and just to prove that none of us are infallible that's uh, me standing in front of the vehicle you can just behind me you can see a yellow bucket which is on the actual track and I'd come through that creek and moved a little bit to the left just to avoid a 50 cent bucket and we were there for four hours uh, stuck in that mess there. I'm never going to swerve for a bucket again after this story. We, uh, we did get out in the end but what was really interesting was that um, this village was a little bit away from our camp but as soon as we were in there a group of men came over and said you know for basically the equivalent of two hundred dollars which is the equivalent of forty days wages said we'll do an hour's work and we'll dig you out um, and, and bear in mind this is where we'd provide free health care, local provisions, food to the community, employment, jobs um, uh, quite an interesting sort of perspective on the, uh, the maroon traveller in, in the end we brought one of our vehicles down from the, um, the camp we had a backup plan which was a satellite phone and called up and said please come and get us but uh, interestingly you know we broke the bull bar on this and we broke cracked a windscreen on a another vehicle and we were there being mosquito bitten till uh, about 7.30 at night in the darkness uh, just to get out of something which swerving for a 50 cent bucket uh, again the, the merit of a backup plan this little video gives you an idea of the sort of roads that are actually here we stopped here on the way that this is to our main supply town Kigoma and we'd hired we couldn't get through it all we'd hired 10 guys for a hundred dollars for an hour just to dig out a bicycle track and you can see here you've got to go down into it. it's hard to describe there's, there's only about 40 feet from one side to the other from where you enter and where you leave and the actual cutting is about two inches from either side of that mirror it's um, it's just typical the roads here there we show you this is another section of the same road the government put in a uh, put a bulldozer through there essentially and cut a road to Mahale National Park from the, the main town and they cleared a swath about 30 meters wide which was great but when they got to the creeks they just pushed the dirt in and we drove through it one week in about five or six hours to Kigoma and the next week it took us nine hours and this is the reason the first drop of rain completely taken it out so backup plan number one was always have a tent in your uh, back of your Land Cruiser in case you needed to stop for a while backup plan number two was always have a pocket full of cash because amazingly enough with a pocket full of cash people would come out of the woodwork and uh, you know appear from where there was no village and there was no farm and, and would come from far around to uh, to help us out and that was the backup plan for getting through some of these creek crossings. This this is a interesting area. You can see how heavily loaded that bicycle is. 
you know, with the drums and the Coca-Cola and um, various other guys carry fresh water to the villages. And so it's a regular little industry supply route. And we're waiting here at the river for the ferry. Now, I'll just let you have a good close look at the picture of the ferry. If you look in the front area there, you'll see the, uh, the ramps have been basically broken off and they're moving blocks of wood to get the vehicles on and off. Um, the actual tilt down ramp, the cables are broken so the ramps don't come up or down anymore. There's four engines on this boat, uh, two on each side, front and rear, and they run four propellers, and only one of them works at any given time. And the MV Illegala is zigzags its way across the river. It's a, it's a true African experience to get across when it does run, and, and quite often you'll sit on it for 40 minutes until they wait till they have enough bicycles and other passengers to take across. But the, uh, yeah, the interesting thing is just behind our land cruiser there on the other side, is a plaque which says MV Illegala 2005. So this is a six year old ferry, if you can believe it. Put in brand new as an aid project and uh, just without the resources or funds to maintain it. Just a challenging, challenging process. And if this isn't working, we face uh, basically a two day round trip to get around just this single section of the river. We, uh, when we came back we brought a dog and you might have noticed him in the earlier picture and uh, we brought a dog for the guys who there in the dry season or the wet season rather when there's only four people at camp we also brought him in as a guard dog and a bit of a mascot and uh, this is Lynn doing Tunza one day all this will be yours now we called him Tunza because we found him on Lake Victoria in a place called Tunza Lodge and in Swahili Tunza means to protect now I'm not quite sure whether we're protecting him or he's protecting us but now he's a much larger dog and he's become a little bit of a focus. It's, it was interesting to see the change in the way um, some of the locals looked at dogs from being just a, a hunting dog that gets underfoot to being actually a friend. And uh, it, it's quite startling to see the difference. In, in the West we have pets. We have dogs as pets. In Africa that concept really doesn't exist in uh, most of the parts of the world. This is a picture of me down on the shore of Lake Tanganyika. I could show you a picture off to the right of the screen of the lake itself, but you know what? It just looks like you're looking at an ocean. It's a massive body of water, second deepest lake in the world. It's 1,400 metres deep. It's a couple of hundred kilometres long. It's, um, it's an ocean, a freshwater ocean. You would swim in it. It doesn't quite reconcile because you're used to salt water in the ocean, but this is just a freshwater ocean. In the mountains behind there, you can see the uh, Mahale National Park and the Mahale Mountains. Pretty much uh, nobody has been in that area. You know, it was first made popular by um, Livingston as he went through here and along the lake. Now it's a national park famous for its chimpanzees. Where we were exploring, we were looking for minerals, um, nickel, platinum group minerals, and, and there's quite a lot of minerals through there. Nothing that as yet an economic deposit but it's was been explored since the 1950s by the Russians who did a great job and they, were, they must have been hard men because back then it was just sheer foot slogging work we were lucky enough to have trail bikes and mountain bikes you can see me there with all the armor on the uh, body armor was a really you know, the, the bikes saved us from having to cut a track which would take 10 days to get to a, perhaps a little target and an outcropping which was, wasn't worth anything in the meantime or even just to navigate to an area but we were literally eight hours flight from Nairobi for a flying doctor service so by the time you called them they flew out came out you were about 24 hours at best from a hospital so really not a lot not a room for error so there was a, a series of kind of backup plans around that the other process we used was mountain biking and here we're mountain biking just behind the Mahale mountains that I showed you in the, an earlier picture and out there it's um, literally pretty much uh, I think no white man has been since Livingston and, uh, and certainly no white woman perhaps ever. So that's, that's a little bit about Africa and the backup plan. It, you can see everything is not quite as you expect and uh, which leads to my next point. Before going to Africa you have a bit of a view of it and you think okay well you know, Africa has got its... Uh, if we put more money into it that'll fix it, if we more aid we'll fix it. They talk about a couple of issues that... Um, security issues now Tanzania is quite a peaceful sort of a place and I think for a whole bunch of reasons you know perhaps the uh, the locals just simply can't be bothered but it's actually been lucky to be quite a peaceful sort of an area. When we were running this uh, camp we took it over from some uh, 
Originally, Australians ran it, and South Africans ran it, then Australians took it again. And so I came in about two and a half years ago, and the prior group and the South Africans had run it completely differently, and they'd had about 32 armed security guards. We had three guys there, and essentially one person on shift, and he would just manage the fuel inventory, the access at the gates, keep track of records. Um, and yes, they had a shotgun, but for safety's sake, it was never loaded. So uh, that, that was a little bit of just a, a deterrent value rather than anything else. It, interestingly, was, I think the reason that the previous crew had a um, 24, in fact, 32 armed guards at one point was that they needed them. They wouldn't go out into the field without an armed guard. They, uh, they'd had three armed incidents where, in fact, where one chap had come into a camp with an automatic weapon and shot it up and stolen the payroll. Another with a roadblock where um, an armed bandit had held them up at gunpoint. When you went back and looked at it, all of those armed incidents, the root cause was disgruntled employees. You know, the payroll robbery was about a disgruntled employee who had put up a soldier to the task and gone into it. And essentially, so what we found, we said we, we can get away with three security guards. We really, the rest of them are doing nothing but getting bored. And uh, we started treating people nicely. We started giving lifts to the locals whenever we had a vehicle running down the track. And you'd find um, women walking with baskets on their head or old men or kids who just needed to get to school. We'd just take them and give them a lift along our way. We, uh, we'd started hiring the locals, paying them decently, treating them well. We had a first aid clinic at the camp and we would use that for the local village. So completely changed. I think we were much safer. We even had a point, just a simple example, when uh, there was a, a couple of armed robbers came into the area, looked there after a specific target, an individual who had some superannuation money paid to him. Um, the grapevine got around and we heard about these guys before they even got within 30 kilometres of us. Um, similarly, we had another example was a, a vehicle. We'd left the radio on. We had HF radios in the vehicles. And one chap walked five kilometres, crossed the creek and five kilometres to camp just to say, hey, by the way, you've, you've left the radio on um, and I can't turn it off because the car's locked. The other interesting thing I found in Africa is uh, the whole process of aid. And, uh, and, and a good example is um, some of the orphanages there. That if you look it up, any number of examples of people running orphanages and I'm not saying all by any means there's certainly some people doing some really really good work but you just need to have a little bit of skepticism if you are putting money into something there because so many cases that we'd come across where there'd be an orphanage and when you actually looked into it of the 15 kids there eight or nine or ten of them belong to the the husband and wife who are running it and when you look at the back they're running around in ragtag clothes because that obviously is a um, raises sympathy and it you know, the kids have enough clothes out at the very back of the orphanage the uh, the father's driving a Mercedes you know, or a Land Cruiser or equivalent so it's you know, nothing's quite necessarily what you seem you think I came across a study a few years ago which I should dig out which looked at a, a span in Africa over 10 years 179 billion dollars worth of aid was put into Africa during the same 10 years 190 billion of, a, of money was expatriated by African leaders into offshore bank accounts. So that's 179 billion in and 190 billion out. And, and it's easy to blame corruption and it's very tempting and to say, well, it's all bad people. And, and yes, that's certainly a degree of truth to that. But equally, you have to put yourself in the context of an African re leader who's got kids who he would like to send to Harvard University as much as anybody else would, or at least to get them to some sort of uh, area of safety to live in Europe or to be able to go to good universities and he knows he's perhaps got six months before the next coup comes along and takes him out so what does he or she do they rip tear and bust and they try to uh, make everything they can so it's it's an endemic problem that simply putting more money into doesn't fix um, another good example was if you can see the bottom left picture there you'll see a clinic at a village called Lubelisi it's a village of about 500 people which was about 27 kilometres from camp and another 27 to the next village of any size. Um, that was built by some uh, well-intended aid workers for around about 30 million shillings, which is about 20,000 US dollars. Now on the right picture you can see our little first aid hut, which is was actually quite deep. It's it's about a third the size of the Lubelisi clinic. We built that for a thousand dollars. 
Um, there were a couple of chaps in the area who very enterprising said, well, we built Lubelisi Clinic or we got, you know, the such and such group helped us build it. Now, do you think you could chip in some money or help us get other aid organisations to chip in 50 million shillings to build a doctor's residence? And we said, well, okay, well, that seems like a lot of money. Uh, why do you need that much? Well, we need a doctor and a nurse, so it has to be two. And I said, well, okay, so who's going to pay the salaries? Oh, the government has agreed to that. So do you have anything in writing to that effect? Well, no. So they could tell you what, well, we'll build some medical heart accommodation that will be suitable. So when a medic comes or a doctor comes, they'll have someone to live. Oh, no, 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 we've let a contract. So I said, we went down the path. Can we see the contract? Oh, yes, and here's the build spec and here's the standard. Um, Honestly, it was quite amazing. The The quote included items like 20, 600 bags of cement at 23,000 shillings each. Now, we were buying bags of cement at the time at 19,000 shillings each, so I'm not sure why it was, you know, we weren't paying local prices by any means, I'm sure. They also included something like, when we worked out the sums, the quantities of nails, was about 350 kilos of nails to build a hut about the size of that, and, and cement, so most of it's built of stone. So in the end, it just simply didn't stack up. So we we essentially said, we'll build it for free. And then the, re the feedback was, no, 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 we, we want to use our contractors, just give us money. So in the end, we didn't go down the path of that. We also received a great business plan from an enterprising local who uh, said, I have a great business plan. I can buy goats here for 2,000, or I think it was 20,000 shillings, and I can sell them in the Congo for 40,000 shillings. Will you lend me 2 million shillings so that I can sell goats to the Congo. Uh, sure, how do you know you're going to get it? The more we dug into it, the less substance there was to it and the higher the risk was. And, and in fact, there was actually no way of returning the money. It was simply just a, will you give me two million shillings? Which brings me to one of my favorite conversations was, will you buy us a tractor? I was sitting around the campfire one night with the guys and they said, look, you know, we'd I like the way you Mzungus grow crops. You grow, you know, have a lot of money because you can grow big areas and you use tractors. Would you buy us a tractor? And we say, well, look, you know, you need to know how to maintain a tractor. And to be honest, we didn't start with tractors. We started with a field and we'd plant a bit more one year and then that would give us a surplus and we'd sell the surplus and we'd use that to pay someone to plough a bit more the following year and buy some fertiliser and we'd get a bit more the year after that and we'd have a bit more surplus and after a couple of years we could hire somebody to put a tractor through there and plough more, then that would give us a big enough crop the following year that we'd be able to buy a tractor. And you could see him nodding at each other, oh yeah, mm, good, yes, good idea, yep, hey, and we could do more, yep, and, and then we'd be able to buy a tractor, yep, and, and just each point, then nodding, and yeah, great idea. And the end of the conversation, yep, you guessed it. So, will you buy us a tractor? Um, you, you simply, you know, the idea that you could simply buy a tractor in there and, and people would be able to make it run, you saw the Illegala Ferry, Without money to buy the fuel, without an understanding of maintenance, without skilled operators, there's absolutely no point in putting a tractor into there. I've seen other um, volunteers in some of the more civilised areas of uh, Tanzania and, and indeed other parts of Africa, and I won't name it, but you could, you could Google it and you could find organisations where you can volunteer, in parentheses, you pay $4,000 a month to come out to Africa and help, and that money gets used to fund orphanages and build hospitals, etc., etc., or so the story goes. And when you look into it, these people come in, they go into essentially a compound, they pay 20 euros a night for a bunk bed where people on the street or backpackers coming in are paying 10 euros a night. They put money into an orphanage, which again, you know, the guy, the person running the orphanage turns out to be the person who's organising the whole process who happens to drive a nice car, if, you know, if not a Mercedes, and at least a brand new Toyota. Um, the money that's going to the hospital is being much siphoned off. So literally, again, you know, this is comes back to other studies which show that about 92% of aid money goes into admin, and only about 8 to 10% gets delivered to aid to the people who need it. You know, my rule of thumb was to these people: I said, if you wanted to, if you want to donate $4,000 a month to come and volunteer in Africa, come out to where we are in the middle of absolutely nowhere and put a well into a village. You'll make a massive difference with it. So it's lest you think you should never do anything to Africa and it's and wash your hands of it, I will say that I've come across a few people. And I put Livingston Tanzania Trust in there because that's another chap I met. Um, his name's Julian by coincidence, so I knew he was a good bloke when we met. It was in a little fly spec village, staying in a two dollar a night accommodation, below backpacker standard, and he's an English guy who just came in and said, I 
I really think I need to make a difference here. I'm sick of the way the, the aid industry runs through here. So he's gone in, he's raised a group of friends to, who've helped him with money. He's built a school, he's built a farm, he's built a training farm. And you know, with a group of other people now, they're actually training local Tanzanians not only to be farmers and to be better farmers, but to train other Tanzanians. So you've got a quite a, um, how can I put it, a very grassroots approach to the people actually putting their time, effort and money into improving a lot of people. Now I did mention at the start I'd promised to uh, tell you how to bribe an official. Now I have to just emphasise that technically I'm, I'm not condoning bribery, I've never paid a bribe, I never will. A bribe is to persuade someone to act in one's favour illegally or dishonestly by gift or inducement. I have however been extorted on a number of times and this is a, it's endemic to East Africa. If you look at the Transparency International Index there are a number of places in the world and East Africa is uh, not top of the pops but it's right up there in the uh, charts. So uh, essentially in any number of areas if you are driving you will forever come across vehicle checkpoints or vehicle cash points as I think I prefer to call them. There is a right way and a wrong way to go about paying this. You can do the very angry person uh, approach and say this is wrong. You can simply pretend it's not going to happen but in the first time I was pulled up I was at a checkpoint on the first bit of bitumen I'd seen for days and I thought fantastic cruising along and we come to a uh, essentially a just a, a couple of trees beside the road policeman walks out flags me down says hello how are you sir so, very good thank you so do you have a driver's license so, yes pull that out says good do you have a uh, fire extinguisher yes I have the mandatory fire extinguisher do you have the safety triangle yes I have the mandatory safety triangle do you have the first aid kit? Yes, I have the first aid kit. Do you have the registration papers? Yes, I have the registration papers. Does your do your lights work? Yes, we'll test the, and the, and this goes on and on. I'm a little bit. I can see where this is going fairly quickly, but I just keep playing the game. Go, yep, I have. In the end, they go to the back of the Land Cruiser pickup that I'm driving and say your reflectors are faded. The reflectors are just a silver sticker on the back, a little red and white striped sticker, and it's required by law on the back of all commercial vehicles. And I said, no, no, my, they're not faded, they're, they're fine, they're there. So, no, no, sir, I'm sorry, they are faded, we will have to fine you. And sure enough, it's it's a 40,000 shilling fine. And I said, well, I'll need a receipt. And he said, oh, well, very good, grumble, grumble. And very quickly, it's 20,000 shillings without a receipt. And and this is the story. So on, on that trip, inevitably, I've been on road trips where I've been pulled up six times a day, literally almost every hour, and you know, in some areas, every 20 minutes. And you very quickly learn that what works is just to be friendly and to be sociable and to just simply have a chat. And in the end, I've actually got it down to uh, literally look, we travel around with a few beers or soft drinks, to, and it's a, about a third of the country's Muslim, so depending on the preference, whether it's beer or soft drink, um, and just hand a police officer, have a, a chat and a smile and say, here's a beer and a bag of cashews for uh, lunch or a bag of chips or whatever it might be. Um, and other times I remember being pulled out once and even uh, chatting to a couple of guys who were so nice that they almost forgot to ask me for money and uh, and I would simply say and then look here's you know, five dollars equivalent ten thousand shillings said you know I know you guys don't get paid much um, so here's just something to make your day and by the way the only catch is you have to spend it on beer I go okay <laughs> all right big laugh and, and, and very quickly that's just I think the reality of a country where people are paid thirty dollars a month and given a badge and basically have to make their own um, way through life so you know also you very quickly learn that a meal um, just before breakfast just before lunch or particularly just before dinner the roads are going to be thick with vehicle cash points and that's the time when you'll be asked for money one of the things I will show you uh, here is um, dealing with immigration this is an example of a receipt for immigration. Um, now I'm going to show you the back of the receipt. And the astute among you will very quickly realise what's going on here. If you think about the back of that receipt, that's where the carbon paper was facing. So I have no idea what's actually on the receipt book when the auditors come through or the division boss comes through but I'm pretty sure it's not $50 or $60 or uh, $200 as the case may be. In fact, I'll give you an example of uh, another great story, just ingenuity. 
This is our uh, was the local hotel about a day's drive away. It was the best standard hotel. You'll notice it's not finished on the roof, and that's simply because if you don't finish it, then you don't have to pay land tax on it. Um, the, despite looking quite decent there, and it is the most decent hotel in the area, it's still pretty basic standard. But it works, it's fine, and you can have an ensuite of a sort. And I'm standing out there one morning, and by the way, this place is called the New Super City Hotel. Uh, which is my favourite name for a hotel ever because it's not new, it's not super, it's not a city and it's only just barely a hotel. But I'm standing out there on the front steps with a couple of other people as there were some uh, other Mzungus there travelling through at the time. So there's about four or five Mzungus and half a dozen Africans and we're just uh, chatting and the immigration officials, or at least a chap in a tie and a business shirt turns up and looks around and you know, quick look at the uh, register and says, oh, I'm looking for Julian Talbot. I'm like, well, I don't know why why me but I said oh that's me so I need to see your visa please and anyway to cut a long story short he's asked to see my visa which has just arrived I've just been given a residency for Tanzania and you'll notice there about halfway down where it says place of residence or a third of the way down place of residence place of work it says DSM for Dar es Salaam now I've been uh, given this and uh, we've actually asked for a few years he said hi hey, I'm sorry my friend you must come with us you are not uh, authorised to work here. I said, why? This is my residence. Oh, this residence does not cover Rukwa district or Kigoma district. Um, long story short, we go to the immigration office and about two hours of being threatened with jail and fines and deportation. And uh, by this point, of course, I'm just sort of like been in Africa long enough to go, yeah, OK, sure, fine. Yeah, I, I get paid whether I'm in jail or whether I'm at work. It's OK. And... Uh, and very quickly the situation becomes probably more relaxed so the less angst I project the less angst they project and very quickly we come to an understanding whereby they issue me a special pass which is 400 US dollars and suddenly my um, visa as you'll notice there is actually Dar es Salaam, Rukwa and Kigoma district um, what's really ingenious when we went back to the paperwork and we checked we had originally applied for all those three in Dar es Salaam and what simply obviously happened is that the chaps in Dar es Salaam issued it only with one. We didn't notice. They shipped it out. They rang their mates in Mpanda and uh, said, when this chap comes into town, you, he will probably need a special pass. And by the way, you should help us with that. Um, and that's just the, one of the things you just don't see coming. It's ingenious. Now, I did also mention I'd tell you how to get arrested for running a first aid clinic and or helping out at a school. Um, in, in short, come out and volunteer your time and uh, we'll have a look through it. This is uh, our first aid clinic at the camp. We'd run it three days a week for the local community. To get to anything approximating a first aid clinic was a day's walk, literally uh, 29 kilometres. Um, and and there, there was two at a, in opposite directions. So we were about in the middle of them at about 60 k's between the two of them. So a day's walk for anybody else. And when you did get here, yeah, they didn't have any uh, medications. Quite often we would take people down there who we thought were too complicated for us to treat legally as a first aid post. But when we took them down, we would always take the drips and the medications and, and what have you. Um, and, and that's our clinic there. Well, simply we had a never ending stream of respiratory tract infections, malaria, you name it, people had it. Um, shingles, jiggle worms, um, skin conditions. One of the trips we did down was when there was a typhoid outbreak at the local village and this was the hallway of the local medical centre and this woman had been there for about four days with typhoid and she was only one of a dozen people there and the champs simply didn't have any drips, um, any antibiotics, anything to give people so we'd take them down there and, and hand them out and that's, they're the kind of things you can make a big difference with in the community. One of the things we also did at the local school, this was the classroom, one of three classrooms and you'll notice in the back a pile of furniture. Um, in fact, that's the pile of furniture in the back. It's, it used to be furniture, it's broken timber, it's old desks, um, literally just fallen apart and nobody to, with the skills to put them together. Um, or even the nails, for example, which cost a fair bit of extra money. We ended up getting a work crew together. A team of us from the camp just came out and spent a couple of days. We, we rebuilt the furniture, moved the bricks. You'll notice that the, the gap between the doorway there and the ground in this third classroom. Inside it was even more pronounced and it was such that there was a from the 
over the 40 feet length of the room from the whiteboard or the blackboard at the front to the back of the room was a three foot drop and really it was just unusable as a classroom. So we got together with, uh, we organised the village, in fact my partner Lynn organised a meeting and we got, not only did we get the village motivated to come in and help us lay the floor, we, we paid a couple of our guys and put the concrete and the nails and the, the equipment into it to put a concrete floor in there. But we managed to find, for a whole range of reasons, the three teachers at the school weren't teaching. Um, they were up the, in Kagoma trying to get paid because they apparently weren't getting their salaries. So we found two people with uh, TAFE or Technical College diplomas uh, in teaching and, and in social sciences and we found two other people with high school degrees who said, yep, we'd like to be teachers. And so we, what we do now is we pay roughly, it costs us about $2,500 a year to pay the salaries of four teachers there and which now means that 450 kids can go to school. So, I mean, they're a pretty ragtag bunch. You're really talking in a, a remote area, but they're a great bunch of kids, and they're just dead chuffed to have anybody show any interest in them and to uh, come and play. We'd, simple things like we'd, whenever we'd go on break, we'd come back, we'd spend a uh, hundred dollars on school books and texts. Now, one of the other things that Lynn would do there, and uh, was apart from volunteering at the school and running a first aid clinic, um, we also had work to do obviously doing uh, survey work and exploration and one of the activities was a helicopter survey and this for a bunch of reasons didn't work out but interestingly enough we had to have a government observer along who was uh, not very supportive how can I put it of some of the initiatives very supportive with lip service saying you're doing great things for the community it's fantastic to which we would say come on out and you know, would you like to talk at the school, give a lecture, you donate a bit of your time with us on one of the work parties, um, to which this uh, particular chap declined to, uh, in fact, offer any assistance. Local Tanzanian chap, and um, for reasons of his own, decided he really didn't want to. What was particularly probably interesting for us was that about, after two months of being there and various challenges with our whole survey, which are probably too boring to go into, but if you've ever dealt with government bureaucracy and... Uh, uh, in a developing country you've got a fair idea of just how uh, challenging it can be. I came across a comment on a LinkedIn site recently, a chap said that uh, the biggest challenge in the resources sector at the moment is the Australian government, to which I politely but tongue in cheek said I think uh, you need to get out more and deal with some other governments around the world. That makes the uh, Aussie government look like a walk in the park. But in any case, uh, about f literally four days after the helicopter crew left and the uh, observer had left, we get a uh, a call from immigration have driven out this incredibly difficult track in a RAV4 which they've hired for the day and I swear the poor driver's going oh, I'm never bringing it out here again he's just about had it stuck in the creek he's dinged it and they've come out looking for myself and a couple other guys who work there and they've specifically said and I believe you have someone else here I said uh, yes you know my partner Lynn said, where is she I said she's helping at the school so does she have a visa for that no, no, she's just volunteering. But what's she doing? She's helping at the school. Okay, so she needs a work visa for that. No, 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 she's not working. She's not getting paid. Ah, that's different. She needs a volunteer's visa. That is a $600 visa. Long story short, after much discussion and then about four or five hours wasted and trips to the school and during which time we've actually had to do a, a first aid treatment for a guy who's been in a fight and had his ribs broken and it broken hip and had to... Uh, transfer him to the local hospital which again a day's drive so we're going through this and immigration is watching this and after much wear and, and we, we're saying look she doesn't need a visa she's not getting paid she's not a volunteer we got managed to get the visa down from and, and literally we're talking about um, not not even veiled outright threats of arrest and deportation it's basically if you don't sort the visa out she's going to jail today so and then we negotiated it down to $200 and the poor village chairman is just about beside himself because he's talking to the immigration officials and saying, and by now I've got enough Swahili to, to get a pretty darn good idea of what he's saying. In fact, I'm just following this conversation discreetly from the side. And he's, uh, he's basically saying, you know, how, how can you charge these people to come out? We have so few people come through. It's hard enough to get anyone to come here, let alone to volunteer. And you want to make them pay for it? And, and he's just beside himself trying to... Uh, trying to influence them but of course to no avail perhaps he did help in negotiating it down from $600 to 
but again you, you get the receipt and you have to go into Impunda to get the passport across and you do the receipt all in all a couple of thousand dollars of wasted time by the time you put everyone together but uh, but that's just the way we do business and that and that's part of uh, one of the challenges now let me have a quick talk about risk in Africa firstly it is ubiquitous it is it exists Africa is a great spot though I don't want to put you off it because it's really a land of adventure and opportunity but in terms of risk management ISO 31000 risk management standard is, is all but unknown risk is just something that happens people endure disease and childhood disease mortality and they you know, workplace health and safety is is entirely optional um, one of our biggest struggles out there was getting people to work safely or at least a little little more safely than they might have um, I, 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 we're coming to the end of the presentation so I won't go into it but I could literally talk for days about stories that have things that have gone wrong or almost gone wrong but in short always have a backup plan throwing more money into aid in Africa isn't the answer there's a right way and a wrong way to go about things and and when you talk about risk management culture and I think culture is mentioned a dozen times in ISO 31000 risk standard it's absolutely culture is everything you need to do things in a sensitive way appropriate to the culture and despite saying you can get arrested for anything I will say it's great we worked six weeks on two weeks off and we had trips we hopped into Rwanda to see the gorillas which is a, an absolute highlight and worth every penny of it it was it's an amazing experience we got told off in Kenya for getting out of the car and uh, wandering around to photograph rhinos we had we slept under the sun uh, and slept under the stars on the Serengeti We've seen the sunrise and the moonrise at the same time over the Serengeti, which is just an absolute highlight, which I'd recommend to everybody. We've uh, we've seen elephants. We've come. We spent so much time. Elephants, perhaps, are our favourite animal there. And we bungee jumped from the world's highest bungee jump, 700 feet in uh, in South Africa, into a canyon there, which is a an absolute hoot. We flew over the uh, the Sisyphus, the skeleton coast of Namibia. Namibia is probably our favourite country for a whole range of reasons I could talk about for hours. But we went sandboarding on those dunes and we flew over them, we camped in them, we, you name it. And one of the highlights, apart from the gorillas, was probably uh, walking with elephants. Uh, and again, one of the things I love about Africa, risk is ubiquitous. Occupational health and safety is almost entirely absent. I, I love the fact that probably in, in Australia you'd never be allowed to do this with a, a what's essentially a wild animal uh, and yet here we are just patting them walking with them and we managed to find time to climb Kilimanjaro which was incredibly cold and the simply tying your shoelaces is makes you feel like you've run a hundred meters in terms of being able to suck in oxygen but it's an amazing continent so ladies and gentlemen thank you very much for your time and for your attention I hope you really enjoyed that and got a little